Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, this is a long title because we wanted to cover a bunch of things. Um, let's see how much we can. Um, so this is, I'm introducing the panel here. I am Amritika Ganguly. I am a, an architect and a principal engineer at Intel's uh, Network and Edge Group, uh, largely working on cloud native uh, technologies like Calico, Envoy, and very recently we started working on SASE solutions. Um, in my panel, we have uh, Shini Adapalli. He is uh, the CTO of Ariaka, um, and uh, he has a depth of experience as a, a fellow at Freescale, working on multiple technologies, other places also, and Envoy and SASE being one of the core technologies that he brings in. We also have Ritu Sood, who uh, is a distinguished engineer working at Ariaka. Um, she has more than 10 years of experience. She has worked at Intel along with us on OpenStack, ODL, Nodus, Emco. And we have Jeff Shaw, uh, a key architect as part of uh, my team, uh, working at Intel on packet processing solutions. So uh, welcome to our presentation on VPN Concentrator and Envoy SASE Proxy um, as in the multi-tenant multi edge. Uh, we'll explore um, SASE and SSE and the need for a proxy there. Uh, why is it crucial? More importantly, SASE has become uh, important since uh, before COVID, just before COVID when people started working from home and it is still prevalent in many, many companies where you need to have tenant uh, frameworks. And how does Envoy uh, fulfill that, uh, that role of a SASE proxy? Why is it an optimal choice? Uh, and what kind of environments uh, do you use that in? VPN concentrators, uh, we'll cover a non-Linux VPN concentrator largely built with VPP. And why is it important to have single tunnel throughput? Uh, per performance within that. Uh, specifically, we'll cover uh, what kind of functionalities that you can extend beyond Ike v2 in IPsec. And uh, on top of that, we'll provide some benchmarking data on Intel Xeon processors, Xeon 4 to Xeon 6. We are launching Xeon 6 pretty soon. Uh, what kind of, uh, if you take any of those uh, solutions, how would you uh, set up a benchmark? What kind of uh, data would you get? How would you scale? So uh, as part of our presentation, we have scaling. We largely show how would you scale from an infrastructure point of view. And at the end, we'll have a short demo and then a Q&A. So I'd like to hand over the next discussion to Shin. Thank you, Mitika. Yeah, um, before we get into the type of changes we made to Envoy proxy for SASE, but I just want to introduce what is SASE and SSE. SASE and SSE is a cloud del delivered network service, right? And it's a multi-tenant. Uh, for any enterprise, typically you have distributed workforce, whether the branch offices or head offices, data centers with applications or remote users. Then they need to access some internet websites or their own enterprise applications, or it could be SaaS applications. So you need security between them. That's what basically SaaS ESSE vendors do, including Ariaka. So these are the kind of a blocks of, uh, you know, you can say network security blocks. Uh, you have uh, uh, SWG, which is a secure web gate to protect, uh, and, uh, you know, employee assets and users going from phishing sites. Then you have CASB. This is to protect subscriptions, and, you know, the data in the SaaS subscriptions. And then you have uh, LLM guardrails to protect uh, your prompts and responses going between, um, you know, clients and uh, Gen AI services. Then you have ZTNA, which I think our Cisco folks talked about it. It's uh, essentially to protect application assets, right? And then uh, you also have NG firewall, which is kind of a to detect exploits that are going to the applications, right? So intrusion detection prevention is one of the key features there. Then you also need to have VPN concentrator because for remote users to, you know, talk to uh, the SASE, SSE, you need some kind of a connectivity for remote users, and that's where VPN concentrator comes into picture. And SASE also has a SD-WAN component, which I won't go through it because it's not relevant for this discussion. 
So if you look at the SASE SSE, the, there are a set of security functions. Uh, like it is a, <clears throat> I mean, you require, uh, uh, I think uh, our Cisco folks also talked about context-based access controls. The context could be user context with multiple JWT claims, or it could be device posture or combination of them, and accessing different application assets or SaaS assets or even uh, websites, right? You also need URL filtering, and you need, uh, um, you know, anti-malware, anti-phishing checks uh, the, on the files being transferred or uploaded or downloaded. Uh, then, of course, you require LLM firewall functionality uh, to look at the prompts and responses to find out whether they are safe or not, whether they are basically have any uh, malicious content, all that stuff. Then, of course, you require API-based firewall, which is required for enterprise apps and SaaS apps. So the requirement is that, you know, we know that 95 to 99% of the traffic is encrypted, HTTPS. And if you want to do this kind of security analysis, you need to basically do the SSL inspection, right? I mean, in case of whether it is users are going to internet websites or the users are going to SaaS applications or enterprise applications, you need to do the SSL decryption. That's how you can get the clear data to do the you know, security analysis, right? That means you need to terminate TCP, terminate TLS, then perform security analysis, then uh, make a new connection towards uh, you know, upstream services. So for all that, you require some proxy technology. And many times, including Ariaka, we have our own proprietary proxies today, uh, but we are trying to move to on Y because of lots of features that are already available, which where we don't have to you know, put a lot of effort. So, but the important thing for SASE SSE is that it has to support all kinds of proxy modes, whether it is a reverse proxy mode, transparent proxy mode, and forward proxy mode, all together at the same time. Right? That is very important. And that's where we found the Envoy proxy to be um, very good for us. Right? It, it already has reverse proxy, transparent proxy support. And it has somewhat good, uh, good enough forward proxy, but we, we enhanced it to have more functionality in the forward proxy. Right? Then it, it is multi-threaded, non-blocking, almost lockless architecture, which actually enables us to you know, scale with number of cores, right, it's performance. And it has many HTTP protocols. It has built-in 1.1, 2.0, 3.0. Uh, that comes very handy. And IPv4, IPv6 support, uh, VASM and the Lua support. We, though we don't use Lua anywhere, but we are providing that option for our customers to you know, deploy Lua script if they want to, right? And it's extensible architecture. I think we talked about, uh, in, the, in the Cisco guys talked about you can have a C++ filters, you can have VASM filters, it's very extensible. And it has built-in RBAC and OAuth to support, right? That, that is very much required for us uh, as part of ZTNA feature, at least. But at the same time, uh, we've, we know that, you know, Envoy proxy is not, you know, is a good start, but we needed to do a lot of enhancements to, you know, uh, support our, our feature, SASE SSE. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Ritu. She'll talk about what kind of changes we made to Envoy as a foundation. And then, of course, we developed many C++ filters for various security functions. So I'm going to hand it over to Ritu. Thank you. Thank you, Srini. Uh, so like how Srini mentioned that uh, uh, you know, we have enhanced uh, SASE, uh, Envoy for SASE in many ways. So the first thing that we did was for uh, multi-tenancy. So Envoy currently, uh, you know, does not support multi-tenancy. And the recommended way to uh, do multi-tenancy in Envoy is to have multiple Envoys running because uh, the configuration is only for one tenant. Uh, so to uh, overcome that, uh, we added configuration isolation where uh, we can have uh, uh, per tenant configuration, and that configuration can be reloaded independently for each tenant. And for um, uh, you know, for uh, the uh, you know where the tenants can have overlapping IP addresses. So we enhanced Envoy to have VRF support, where uh, the traffic can be isolated based on VRF. 
And the tenant selection is done based on uh, policy, and uh, the policy uh, uses various uh, network parameters like uh, port numbers in forward proxy case, or domain names, or the IP address and the port number on which the traffic is landing on the proxy. Uh, so for the forward proxy uh, authentication, we uh, copied the uh, uh, Envoy code in around a couple of years back. And at that time, there was a good support for um, transparent and reverse proxy, but uh, forward proxy, we had to make some enhancements. Uh, so forward proxy is basically needed for ease of uh, getting to the proxy from the browser. Uh, and we wanted to use single sign-on uh, features so that whatever credentials the tenants have logged in into their laptop, uh, they should be able to use the same credentials for uh, authenticating with the SASE. So we use Kerberos uh, for that. And we also have a username and password uh, uh, support for forward proxy. And uh, yeah, and then uh, Srini mentioned that how we have to inspect, do TLS inspections of uh, most of the use cases for Envoy are as sidecar or front-ending um, uh, applications, but in our case, we wanted the internal connections going to internet also uh, coming through this proxy, so we uh, added uh, the TLS um, inspect, uh, like we added the mimic set generation based on the enterprise CA into Envoy. Uh, so the uh, OAuth filter was already there, but it did not have multi-client uh, support. So we added multi-client support where uh, multiple clients and, uh, uh, you know, can be chosen based on policy, and uh, you can register your client with client ID secret, and the claims are generated for the clients. And uh, Envoy has, like, very good uh, policy framework, right? Uh, uh, but we had some requirements where we wanted the framework to be more modular so that it can be used in different filters. And we have a requirement of having many tables, a uh, lot of tables. So for that, we created like a library of the policy framework, uh, existing policy framework so that it can be used across different uh, filters. And um, Envoy also um, uh, has this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, policy of enforcement where the deny and the policies are, are considered first, and if any of those matches, then we go to the allow policies. Uh, so uh, instead of that, uh, we also added support for priority-based policy evaluation. Um, and uh, another feature we added is uh, policy chaining. Uh, so, currently, the configuration on the various listeners uh, is, has to be repeated, but uh, in our use case, many of the tenant traffic could be landing on different ports. Uh, and so, what, uh, so to just to, for saving on the space and uh, memory consumption, we uh, added support where you can reference to um, add reference to configuration uh, from the listeners. Uh, so Envoy is the central piece for our uh, SASE solution, but to make the complete solution, uh, we need a few other components, and this picture is kind of showing our complete solution. Uh, so we have PowerDNS as an authoritative server. So most, most of these components we are using from open source and um, a strong span as our VPNC for terminating the VPN tunnels. Uh, Gokomole we are using for webification and for admin users for SSH and RDP. And Keyclock is acting as an IDP broker and connecting to the tenant um, IDPs. Uh, so, on, uh, so for this setup, right, Kubernetes is a very good choice as in Kubernetes, you can have horizontal pod scaling and um, where we can uh, scale out these components uh, as and when needed. And also, uh, the metrics that can be used are not just uh, CPU and memory consumption, uh, but also 
stuff like HTTP uh, connections and so on, and all of that can be provided out of the box, like without making any changes. So um, we are going with Kubernetes for that. Uh, so some of the challenges this architecture brings is like, uh, so between the VPN uh, concentrator and Envoy, we are using Genevi tunnels uh, to pass the ta uh, traffic, and there is one Genevi tunnel per tenant to keep traffic isolated and also for IP address overloading. Uh, so, uh, so as the number of uh, uh, pods are increased, uh, the, these tunnels and their configuration and routing also has to be um, uh, configured. Uh, and the other uh, big um, performance bottleneck is um, on the VPNC side, right, uh, where we have requirement of our 10 or 20 GB uh, per tunnel, but Linux um, uh, can only support like 4 G GB per tunnel. So that is where, um, you know, our next part of the talk comes in picture where we are uh, using um, VPP-based um, uh, uh, solutions. So I'll hand it over to Jeff. Uh, to talk about that. Thanks, Ritu. <clears throat> so as Ritu just mentioned, uh, the VPNC is the part of the solution that performs IPsec. Uh, so IPsec, due to its use of cryptography, tends to be very compute intensive. Uh, and to provide this service uh, as efficiently as possible, uh, sometimes POPs are limited to you know one to two servers. You can't just um, allocate dozens of, of, of cores to perform IPsec, um, <clears throat> you, you just won't have any capacity to actually run your workload, so it really comes down to performance and scale. We want to maximize the overall throughput, um, scale the number of active connections and connections per second with as few CPU cores as possible. Uh, this is where the VPP data plane really shines. Uh, VPP is a fast, scalable, Multi, uh, layer two to four multi-platform network stack with highly optimized IPsec implementation. And this chart shows uh, throughput of IPsec and scalability across multiple cores. Obviously, a lot of factors can impact the performance, uh, so I recommend you go and check out the white paper where this data was originally published. Um, but the key takeaway here is that uh, VPP IPsec is very fast. Um, it achieved <clears throat> nearly two terabits per second um, on a dual socket uh, Intel Xeon 4, Xeon fourth generation scalable processor. Uh, so yeah, go re go read the go read the white paper. It's pretty good. Um, this next slide shows more data with more la uh, latest generation processors. We're publishing a white paper on this soon with a variety of different workloads. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. Um, but basically, this is to call out the difference between like a, a performance core. Uh, which tends to have, you know, uh, higher frequencies, uh, fast IPCs, um, enhanced uh, instruction set architecture, especially for crypto, uh, to perform IPsec and other crypto operations as fast as possible. Um, on the alternative, you have uh, an efficient core, which is a much denser, uh, smaller core where you can pack a lot more onto the system, um, and you tend to get a better performance per watt profile. Um, so like I said, um, we're going to be publishing a white paper here pretty soon with a variety of different workloads. Uh, so, so look out for that. Uh, the actual VPNC architecture, <clears throat> this is a pretty simplified diagram. Uh, I'm not showing everything that goes into our solution. Here I'm not showing, you know, routing daemon. I'm just not showing, um, you know, any kind of device plugins or anything like that. Uh, this is really just focusing on the IPsec part of it. Um, so at the bottom of the picture here, you have uh, some network interfaces. Uh, these provide connectivity to your underlay network. Uh, right above that, you have VPP data plane. <clears throat> so this is the thing that's processing all of the packets on the network. Uh, depending on the type of traffic, we either punt uh, control plane traffic to Linux uh, to be using the Linux control plane plugin part of VPP, uh, which gets processed by StrongSwan uh, to perform the Ike uh, v2 control plane. Um, um, and we have a, a, an agent running on the machine also um, that exposes a gRPC server and API that can configure IPsec uh, connections in StrongSwan as well as, you know, interface details, tunnels, bridges, um, IP address configuration, anything having to do with VPP. Um, <clears throat> key point here is that the StrongSwan performs the IPsec control plane 
when it negotiates or establishes a child essay, um, the security association parameters, key material, policy information, everything like that gets installed into the VPP data plane uh, using the StrongSwan VPP plugin, um, at which point VPP now is capable of performing the IPsec encryption and, and, and decryption. Um, this architecture is flexible enough so we can install it on bare metal and VM using distro packages or we can deploy um, as a set of containers uh, using like Docker Compose or inside of a Kubernetes pod. Um, and I, I mentioned the title of a white paper. The link is sometimes changes, so I just mentioned the title of the white paper, so search. Um, you can find uh, more, inf more information on this particular design where this is based off of, so. Um, so then this is the VPNC architecture drawn a little bit differently. Um, where we look at the network topology. So you can think of each one of these rectangles as a uh, separate site to which the VPNC has a IPsec connection. So consider the case where you have a remote access user uh, that wants to access some kind of uh, web resource inside of an enterprise data center somewhere um, behind, a, behind a tenant's gateway. Um, the, the user will, access, will connect to the network through the proxy. Uh, the proxy will feed that uh, packets into the VPN concentrator, which ultimately will route the uh, packet to the appropriate IPsec tunnel um, so that it gets, you know, moves towards the, uh, the tenant gateway. Uh, one of the key requirements, as everybody mentioned already, is that um, we need to support multi-tenancy on the shared infrastructure. Um, so we have to isolate traffic between tenants. Uh, and one of the other key requirements is that tenants have to have overlapping IP addresses. I know we touched on this already. Um, <coughs> So you can see here, you know, what I mean by overlapping IP addresses, obviously tenant one and tenant N here are both advertising 10.1 network, um, but they're not the same network, right? These are completely different tenants. Um, so you can't just, you know, blindly route packets. Uh, so we achieved this by using Geneva overlay network um, per, t per tunnel tenant, per tenant, per tenant, excuse me, tunnels uh, configured between the proxy and VPP um, along with separate routing tables inside of VPP. Uh, so if we zoom in a little bit on the, this is the relationship between the proxy and the VPN, uh, VPNC, excuse me. Um, so the prox proxy has to handle traffic from any tenant, right? So, um, and a connection comes into, comes into the, the proxy and it, you know, has to be, has to be, goes through the VPNC somehow. Um, so the proxy has to have a Geneep tunnel configured for every tenant between every proxy to every VPNC in the system. Um, so when it receives that packet, you know, de decides the right VPNC to send it to, um, does the encapsulation, sends it over, to, over that Geneve tunnel into the, uh, into the VPNC. Uh, that traffic is terminated inside of, v inside of the VPNC, inside of a specific VRF. Uh, so that tunnel endpoint basically exists inside of a VRF. Inside of that VRF, we have, you know, the per tenant routing uh, specific, you know, information, um, as well as any IPsec tunnels that are configured. Uh, so that way we can route the packet appropriately, um, you know, without, you know, we can separate the traffic basically using VRS is essentially what happens. Um, and then the same thing happens in the reverse path as well. Uh, so IPsec traffic is terminated in the opposite direction, um, terminated in the VRF and then routed onto the appropriate Geneve tunnel, uh, depending on, you know, the, the information inside of the inner packet. Uh, we can use ECMP to distribute traffic uh, to multiple of the participating proxies. Uh, so that's an overview of the VPNC. I'm going to hand it back over to Mirtika, uh, who's going to talk more about some of the Envoy optimizations that we've done. Thanks, Jeff. So um, it, this uh, simplistic architecture is actually uh, built into a solution, a reference solution. Um, uh, specifically, Envoy, uh, we have, like Jeff showed, uh, used it uh, uh, to front end. Uh, but as a SASE proxy, um, as a reverse proxy, what are some of the bottlenecks that you will face? And what can we do about it? So this is a, a very simple pipeline for Envoy. We focused on uh, two areas, uh, like as you set up uh, Envoy for number of threads, number of concurrent connections, um, you may set up the proxy for four-core, eight-core uh, deployment. Um, 
if you do a flame graph analysis based on the number of uh, customers you'll have, number of connections, and then the outbound connections also, and the number of threads. Uh, two core areas where we saw uh, bottlenecks uh, showing up. One is uh, the TLS, the TLS processing, and um, SSL handshakes uh, uh, would take up uh, a large part of the uh, CPU uh, processing time, cycle time. And uh, specifically on this, we created a solution, uh, two types of, of acceleration solutions. So um, it's a key provider extension. Uh, Envoy already provides that. So we extended the key provider to um, be able to be processed using uh, uh, AVX 512, which is a SIMD operation. Um, so essentially do uh, uh, create a buffer, a multi-buffer, and then uh, send it uh, to be accelerated by one instruction. Um, and so that's uh, showing up as uh, the crypto MB uh, API extension box that you see there. In addition, we have uh, a specific accelerator, hardware accelerator uh, within the CPU called a QAT. Uh, if you uh, initialize that accelerator inside Envoy, you are essentially taking away uh, processing cycles from the CPU, so you are saving CPU cycles. Now, how would you uh, initialize this solution? Essentially, um, so you'll have the, your control plane. Uh, you define the resources and the requests that you, uh, that you want to. So against certain number of requests, you want to uh, initialize, say, a QAT uh, instance, right? And so you set that up through a control panel, uh, to a control uh, plane. And then on the node where you have Envoy initiated, you have the drivers installed for uh, QAT for uh, the generic AVX uh, QAT driver. Uh, you have a, a, a Kubernetes plugin, device plugin. So you have you initialize that, and that's shown up here as Intel QAT plugin. And uh, within your uh, kubelet, you initialize a container D uh, instance where you essentially uh, connect the Envoy instance with a virtual interface, a VFIO interface. So the QAT acceleration device can be initialized as device one, device two, device three, as different VFIO devices. And uh, each of these devices have a number of queues. You can allocate a number of queues from that, each VFIO instance inside Envoy. So at the um, pod level, you have QAT lib to, in, uh, to work with the QAT VFIO interface, uh, initi uh, make use of the QAT plugin to do the offload onto QAT. If you do not want to use QAT and just want to use uh, AVX 512, and I'll show you why and when you would want to use either the Crypto MB or AVX 512 solution or use the QAT solution, but you could use either of them. And the provider that can be created on top of it, there are some sample providers. We have a sample provider internally, which I don't think we have uh, open sourced, but anybody wants that, we could work with you on that. So that will help you offload some of the TLS processing uh, using uh, this kind of a solution. The other area where we saw bottlenecks happen, and especially when you have different kind of requests going through Envoy, if you have a text request or an audio request or a video request, especially when you are um, working with LLM solutions, you will have that uh, multimodal requests. You will see uh, uh, the load balancing of Envoy processor threads not being equal. Uh, so Envoy provides a load balancing extension. So we extended that. Uh, we made sure that the NIC RSS that happens to the cores uh, that's basic. So when you uh, when you have the load balancing extension for Envoy initialized, it should be able to use if you set up the uh, the NIC driver to do RSS. Uh, in addition to that, if you do a profiling of the CPU usage of the worker threads, you will see a, a, a not being balanced, especially if you have different types of sizes of requests. And so there is another acceleration uh, that we have uh, called dynamic load balancer, which is another PCI device. We provide a similar interface. For example, we have on top of the driver, we have a Kubernetes uh, plugin that you initialize. You have the Kubelet container D. 
define the resources, work with the control plane. You can initialize a VFIO interface to the device. You can have one or more devices. We have generally seen the need of just one device, uh, one DLB device to be used in, in, in deployments like a four core or an eight core. And uh, that's how you initialize it back into one way. So two different kinds of accelerations for these bottlenecks. Now, some sample uh, data points. So for example, for the load balancing uh, plugin that we have, uh, we have seen largely a benefit to latency. So the latency uh, discussions that happened early on, uh, some of the latencies can be mitigated if you have different kind of request sizes. So as the graph shows, you can have request sizes ranging from one kilobyte to 10 kilobyte, one megabyte, or a mix. Uh, so in our benchmarking, uh, and we created, we actually enhanced uh, Nighthawk as a benchmarking tool, and we have shown that you can improve uh, latencies uh, in this model. You do not get any other, and, and this is for maximum CPU usage, so all core CPU usage will be maximum, and within that environment you can get uh, all the way up to almost, this is I think about 70% latency improvement in this specific experiment. On the SSL performance, we have a combination of uh, cores uh, and data points. So just to focus on the kind of performance you'll get on a request per second, uh, if you scale the number of cores from one core, two core, all the way up to eight core, 16 thread, uh, and this is for one of the uh, performance cores that we have, which is a multi-threaded core. Within that environment, you'll see different kinds of uh, performance uh, benefits that you'll get. So for example, if you use the AVX 512-based crypto multi-buffer solution, you can see it scale in almost all solutions, uh, in all uh, scaling requirements, whether it is uh, two core or eight core, you'll see it scale all the way through. Now, if you want to save those cycles, and you decide to offload to uh, the hardware accelerator QAT. You initialize one, and you'll see the four core eight thread provides enough uh, benefits so that you, you get it only from one device. Uh, as soon as you go to an eight core 16 thread, you'll see the benefit is larger when you have two QAT devices uh, as opposed to the AVX 512 uh, solution. So, the, these are different benchmark entities. You can benchmark your uh, environment, and uh, we can help with some of those benchmarks, and you can decide you know, what kind of uh, solution would benefit. You can make this dynamic. So one of the things we wanted to discuss, but we haven't really put in the whole solution, but you can monitor this and make sure that when you are reaching a particular threshold where it does not make sense, to use the multi-buffer AVX 512 and instead start using the offloaded version. And some of that is already automated in the provider that is there, in the QAT plugin that is already there. It will decide when to do CPU-based versus QAT-based. You'll also get benefits in latency. So this is showing about 70 to 90% latency benefits uh, with, with this kind of acceleration in here. All of this data is on uh, uh, fourth generation Xeon, we have other solutions that are coming out, largely cache sizes, Envoy benefits from larger cache size. So we have uh, Xeons coming out with larger cache, cache size. Uh, there is a set of data points that Jeff showed where performance scores versus efficiency scores. Efficiency scores will bring you uh, single-threaded CPUs, and uh, what does Envoy uh, provide you in that environment? What kind of workloads would benefit from that? is a topic of discussion maybe in another presentation. Okay. I'd like to show you a demo of what we have. Um, I'll, I'll talk you through the demo. Essentially, we put together a deployment of the VPP-based VPNC and an Envoy proxy. Uh, okay, so you'll see on the top right-hand side the deployment happening. Essentially, site one, site two connecting two VPNCs connecting to each other. So first, the deployment of all the containers happen here. You'll see the VPNCs getting deployed, and then Envoy gets deployed, and a benchmark uh, IP, IPERF server client just to communicate. And then on the left-hand bottom side, you'll see the client container getting started. Uh, 
and then the side-to-side -side SASE pipeline is now running. Now, one of the things we have uh, put together in our solution is an OPI API for configuring the VPNCs. Once you configure uh, the network for the VPNC, you'll next configure the Envoy proxy as an endpoint to the Geneve tunnel. Some of our MAC addresses have been blurred out. Okay, so now you have the, the endpoint HTTP server process is started up, which will, now you will be able to communicate client to VPNC site one, VPNC site two, Envoy proxy to the endpoint servers. And we have plugged all of this, uh, the data being collected from all of these entities into Prometheus and Grafana, and you should be able to see, uh, plug in more of your resources. The important thing is to be able to scale this uh, largely scaling horizontally. The, the VPP containers, VPP applications, we won't be able to scale them um, you know, horizontally, uh, sorry, vertically, but horizontally you should be able to scale them. The Envoy uh, proxies, if they are within a Kubernetes pod, you could be, you would be able to add new, uh, you know, additional cores, but again, Envoy may need to be restarted for being able to uh, benefit from that. Ideally, you would like to scale, if you are monitoring in this form in a uh, Kubernetes uh, Prometheus environment, then you should be able to start new Envoy proxies based on some of those latency numbers which we showed or the requests per second. So I'll, uh, this is one of the things we wanted to do um, is share all the white papers if you want to uh, connect with us. All the Envoy extensions and accelerations are already upstreamed. The VPP work is going on and we can collaborate with you. We of course work with the VPP community to upstream a bunch of, a bunch of that work. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions to my panel and then we'll open up. No, we don't have time? Okay. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay. Okay, thank you so much.